I was raised to believe that the Bible defines good and evil for us within its pages. But when we stop and examine this idea using the Bible, we discover something else. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A tree that would bring life to all who ate of its fruit, and a tree that brought death. And it was the second tree, the tree that resulted in death, that contained the knowledge of good and evil. Have we been deceived by the serpent who is trying to get us to eat of the second tree? Is the Bible really trying to define good and evil for us? Let's take a step back. Let's run an experiment. Instead of seeking to define good and evil, let's instead ask the question of the trees. Let's attempt to define life and death, but to do so, we must first seek it out. So join us as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, Aaron Bishop here. just wanted to let you know I have written a book. It has been published and it is available now on Amazon.com. The name of the book is The Power of Passover, A Christian's Guide to the Festival of Redemption. If you want to know what Passover is about, just a really deep dive into the festival, into its history, and into why we're where we're at today. And even an instruction guide on how to hold your own Passover. It's got everything in it. So if you'd like to check that out, go to Amazon.com and search for The Power of Passover. And now we return you to your regularly scheduled program. Hey everybody, welcome to the Deresh Chai Experiment, the show where we examine biblical text in light of the context that it appears in to determine the greater purpose for the text at hand. Here in this middle portion of the book of Numbers, we are treated to a lot of narratives. And it is to these narratives that our attention wants to turn. We love stories. They're entertaining. They hold our attention. Uh, we don't like the command so much, especially in the book of Numbers, because they seem out of place with what's occurring in the narrative. But as we went through the first part of the book of Numbers, I demonstrated that there was a flow of ideas that was being presented that created a continuous path from one end to the other. This flow of ideas that introduced topics in one form and then dealt with the fallout of those topics in the form of commands that seemed confusing and out of place. That is, until we could discern the thread that connected these topics together. And once we discerned the thread that connected these commands to what had been introduced earlier, we were able to see clearly the purpose for each, and from that we could tease out details of meaning that would otherwise have remained shrouded. And we find this all through Scripture. The same idea being approached from various perspectives and literary styles to give us, the reader, various ways to see and to discern what Scripture wants to tell us. And so when we go to the central section of the book of Numbers, there was great rejoicing, for we had stories to cover. I mean, sure, they are warning stories that describe failures of the people on multiple levels, but they're stories, they're entertaining, they're familiar. And for the last four chapters and the last four weeks, it has been our pleasure to dig into these narratives and to discuss the characters and the situations that Israel faced. And as we did so, we recognized something of great importance. In each situation, it was the tongue that got the people in trouble. It was the tongue that kindled the fires of discontent. In chapter 11, it was the tongue directed against the gift that Hashem gave the people in the form of manna every morning. This wasn't enough variety, and there was, of course, no meat, and so the gift gets slandered and Egypt gets held up as the prime example. In chapter 12, it was the tongue directed at Hashem's appointed leader. He didn't conform to the societal expectations of what a leader should look like and do. How he conducted his private life was not acceptable, and after all, weren't they all important? Didn't they all have gifts that made them important before Hashem? In chapter 13, the tongue was directed against the promise that God had made and his ability to deliver on that promise. The fearful things of the world that had been seen with their eyes took precedence. The fear of just a few men then gripping the entire nation and causing them all to cry out in fear. And in chapter 14, the people slandered the plan that Hashem had to bring them into the land. This entire exercise has been futile, they decide, so let's turn back to Egypt. There we were comfortable in the evil that we knew. This plan to bring us out into the wilderness, it was stupid from the beginning. And after all of this, 
Only after a series of failures was a judgment then levied at the entire nation. Forty years. You will be forced to wonder, forty years, and everyone who is alive today who has tried me and tested me will be cut off from the midst of you. And just after they had slandered the plan to bring them into the land, the people realized that the alternative is worse. And in their grief, they once again reject something of Hashem. They reject the judgment and the change in plan. And at the end of chapter 14, we read how the people finally spoke a false repentance. Confession, turning away from their sins, sorrow at having sinned. Each of these were present. In all of this, though, they didn't turn towards Hashem and towards His command. And now, after four chapters of narrative, this week we find the narrative interrupted. Once again, a perfectly good story, ruined by an out-of-place chapter that contains the finer points of sacrificial law, among other things. And once again, we scratch our heads at the placement of this chapter, here of all places, and the seeming schizophrenic nature of the book of Numbers rears its head once again. At least, that's what it seems like on the surface. But perhaps it's not. Perhaps this chapter is exactly where it should be. Perhaps this chapter addresses the events of the previous four chapters in various ways. Perhaps, just perhaps, there's more going on here than what it would seem. I submit that this chapter is not out of place. I submit that this chapter contains the ideals that address all that we have just read. That this chapter acts as a summation that allows us to gather our thoughts and combine all that we have just read to gather it just before the narrative dives off into one of the most poignant stories in Numbers. So let's read this chapter, and then let's discuss the countermeasures that are provided in this chapter to combat the failures that we have just encountered. Numbers chapter 15 And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have come into the land of your dwellings which I am giving you, and you make an offering by fire to Hashem, an ascending offering for sacrificing, to accomplish a vow or as a voluntary offering, or in your appointed times to make a sweet fragrance to Hashem from the herd or the flock. When he who brings near his offering to Hashem shall bring near a grain offering of one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of oil, and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering, you prepare with the ascending offering or the sacrifice for each lamb. Or for a ram you prepare as a grain offering two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour, mixed with one-third of a hin of oil. And as a drink offering you bring one-third of a hin of wine as a sweet fragrance to Hashem. And when you prepare a young bull as an ascending offering, or as a sacrifice to accomplish a vow, or as a peace offering to Hashem, then shall be brought with the young bull a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour, with half of a hin of oil. And bring as the drink offering half a hin of wine as an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Hashem. This is what is done for each young bull, for each ram, or for each lamb or young goat. According to the number that you prepare, so you do for each one according to their number. Let all who are native do so with them in bringing near an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Hashem. And when a stranger sojourns with you, or whoever is among you throughout your generations, and would make an offering by fire, a sweet fragrance to Hashem, as you do, so he does. One law is for you, of the assembly, and for the stranger who sojourns with you. A law forever throughout your generations. As you are, so is the stranger before Hashem. One Torah and one judgment is for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land to which I bring you, then it shall be when you eat of the bread of the land, that you present a contribution to Hashem, present a cake of the first of your dough as a contribution, as a contribution of the threshing floor you present it. Of the first of your dough you are to give to Hashem a contribution throughout your generations. And when you sin by mistake and do not do all these commands which Hashem has spoken to Moshe, All that Hashem has commanded you by the hand of Moshe from the day Hashem gave commands and onward throughout your generations. Then it shall be, if it is done by mistake without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall prepare one young bull as an ascending offering, a sweet fragrance to Hashem, 
with its grain offering and its drink offering according to the judgment, and one male goat as a sin offering. Then the priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was by mistake. And they shall bring their offering, an offering made by fire to Hashem, and their sin offering before Hashem for their mistake. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel, and the stranger who sojourns in their midst, because all the people did it by mistake. And if a being sins by mistake, then he shall bring a female goat, a year old, as a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for the being who strays by mistake, when he sins by mistake before Hashem, to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. For him who does whatever by mistake, there is one Torah, both for him who is native among the children of Israel, and for the stranger who sojourns in their midst. But the being who does whatever defiantly, whether he is native or a stranger, he reviles Hashem, and that being shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of Hashem, and has broken his command, that being shall certainly be cut off, his crookedness is upon him. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moshe and to Aaron and to all the congregation, and they put him under guard because it had not been declared what should be done to him. And Hashem said to Moshe, The man shall certainly be put to death, all the congregation stoning him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones as Hashem had commanded Moshe, and he died. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them to make tzitzit on the corner of their garments throughout their generation, and to put a blue cord in the tzitzit of the corners. And it shall be to you for a tzitzit, and you shall see it, and you shall remember all the commands of Hashem, and shall do them, and not search after your own heart, and your own eyes after which you went whoring, so that you remember, and shall do all my commands, and be set apart unto your Elohim. I am Hashem your God, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim. I am Hashem your Elohim. Back in the beginning of Numbers, I made a claim. I stated that the book of Numbers is sublime, and I pointed to a convention that's used throughout the book of Numbers to support this claim. And I stated that it was in the central portion of the book that we saw this convention the clearest, but that the convention exists throughout the entirety of the book of Numbers. And this week we run into this convention for the first time in the middle portion of the book of Numbers. I brought it up before we read, but this convention, once we learn to see it and use it, provides a level of beauty to the book of Numbers. This random hodgepodge collection of stories and commands congeals into something that is powerful and meaningful on every page. Everything in place as it should be. And that leads us to this week's text. Seemingly disconnected from what just happened. Grain and libation offerings that accompany the other sacrifices? What does this have to do with anything? Or giving of a first fruits of any bread that's baked? Okay, we can possibly see easily how the section on accidental versus high-handed sin might apply, but the short story about the man picking up sticks? Uh, again, we're lost. And then tzitzit. Well, that one's pretty easy when we take a moment and think about it. But each of these sections addresses something that has occurred in the previous four chapters. Each one is directed at the hearts of Israel who grumbled and acted faithless. So this week, we're going to do things just a little bit different. Rather than going through this chapter in order, we're going to reverse the order in which we address each of these sections. And the reason for this is simple. We can easily identify the reason for the command for tzitzit at the end of the chapter. But the stuff closer to the front, the additions to the sacrifice and first fruits of the bread, we have a harder time with this. And so using the easy to spot, we can discover how this works and then develop the tools. And then as we proceed backward through the text, we can then apply the tools to the harder to discern sections. So tzitzit. When people come to an understanding of the validity of Torah, this is one of the first things that usually gets addressed by most. And often, and I know for myself it was this way, we begin to keep this command with no real understanding of its purpose. And yet, if we read these four verses on tzitzit, which is our primary source for this command in Scripture, we find the purpose for these strings stated clearly. And that is found in verse 39. And you shall see it, and you shall remember all the commands of Hashem. 
In essence, tzitzit are an ancient form of a what-would-Jesus-do bracelet. It's the proverbial string around the finger as a reminder, but these strings are attached to our clothing. And in this stated purpose we find the first way that this chapter speaks to the events of the previous chapters. Why is it that Israel was forbidden from entering the land? Well, it was because the spies trusted what their eyes told them of the land and its inhabitants, and they forgot the words of Hashem. These fringes are designed to be countermeasures for this. The command is given, do not trust your eyes, trust the word of God. Now, there are a few things associated with tzitzit that are not explicitly stated in scripture, but that we find ample evidence of in archaeology and history. First off, there's the composition of tzitzit. In verse 38, we read that a blue cord is to be part of the tassels that make up the tzitzit. Now, in Judaism, this presents a conundrum because their modern word for blue is different than the word that's used in this passage. And so they believe that the word techelet, which is used here, refers to a specific shade of blue that's made in a very specific way. Now, frankly, I don't know if this is correct or not, but it is because of this unknown quantity that Judaism chooses to not include the blue thread at all in their tzitzit. In their perspective, it's better to not have it at all than it would be to use the wrong color and potentially introduce a strange fire situation where they are doing something that is not commanded. Because of this, if you wear tzitzit with a blue thread around a traditional Jew, they will instantly know that you are a Messianic Gentile. Now, based on other archaeological and other evidence, we ha- we have discovered that the tzitzit of the past were made up of a combination of white linen threads and a blue woolen thread. Wool and linen mixed. From 40 BC to the 11th century, we find various rabbinic sources that refer to this. Uh, Targum Jonathan alludes to this in Deuteronomy 22.12. This states that woolen fringes were allowed on a linen garment. Rashi states in Yev 4a that the fringes were specifically to be wool and linen mixed. Mishnah Menachem 39b through 40a and 43a, which was written in the 1st century AD, also state this. Midrash Leviticus Rabbah in 22.10 mentions that the tzitzit are specifically shat nez, a word that we'll deal with in another chapter. Abraham Eben Ezra, commentary on Deuteronomy 22.12, states the same thing, and others speak of this. The forbidden mixture of Leviticus 19 was understood to be part of these tassels. The mixtures that are forbidden, whether the cloth, the anointing oil, the incense, or others, are considered to represent chaos. It was understood that it was in the realm of the priesthood to make order out of chaos. Thus, they were allowed to deal with these forbidden mixtures. Exodus 28, 5-6 And they shall take the gold, and the blue, and the purple, and the scarlet material, and the fine linen, and shall make a shoulder garment of gold, and blue, and purple, and scarlet material, or wool, commonly understood, and fine woven linen, the work of a skilled workman. These mixtures were considered holy, and so they were given to the realm of the holy, those who dealt with holy things. One archaeological dig from the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt discovered bodies that had their clothing still intact, second century clothing, and on the hem of the garments of the Hebrews were Sha'anet's tzitzit. This mixture was thought to be allowed in the fringes because of what it represents. Having a garment of wool and linen mixed was a sign of holiness. It was allowed for the high priest in the ephod that he wore. It was allowed for the regular priests in the girdle or belt that they wore. The veils of the tabernacle contained this mixture as well. This mixture was a holy mixture, forbidden from the common man in his clothing. But in the accessory that was attached to his garment, the one that reminded him of his inherent holiness and the holiness of God, in this the mixture seems to have been allowed by God to remind Israel of their own holiness and the role that the entire nation had as priests for Hashem to the nations. And again, this addresses the discontent that's going to come out next week in the 250 firstborn because they were replaced as the priests of Hashem. 
the tzitzit are, in a way, a corollary of the Nazarite vow. One is a vow that anyone could take to serve Hashem. The other is a reminder to everyone, whether under a vow or not, of the necessity of obedience to Hashem, and their inherent holiness because of their proximity to Hashem. And finally, the position on the garment where the tzitzit were to be placed. Now, this is something that we don't understand as modern people, but the hem of a person's garment was where their honor was declared for the world to see. And the fringes on the hem of the garment were not unique to Israel. Again, we have archaeological evidence from the tomb of Seti I that it was common among Mesopotamian peoples to wear fringes on the hems of their garments. If you dig into other ancient sources, the fringes on the, in other cultures were reserved for those who were in a position of authority. You see, the common man did not worship the national gods in their temples. Only those in national power worshipped the national god. And the priests would know who to allow into the big temples based on whether or not they wore fringes. The common man worshipped a household god because the big gods frankly didn't care about them. And those without honor did not wear fringes, only those in a position of honor or power. The fringes represented authority in a kingdom and a relationship with the national and big-time God. And so we see this convention expanded in Israel. The tzitzit described here says that every man in Israel that worships and has a relationship with the big national God, everyone was allowed in the temple, everyone was part of the worship of Hashem. And the hem of the garment, as I stated before, was the place of honor on the garment. The hem is where symbols of status were kept. Exodus 28, 33 through 34. And on its hem you shall make pomegranates blue and purple and scarlet material all around its hem and bells of gold between them all around, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate on the hem of the robe all around. The hem of the robe audibly declaring the status of the one who wore this garment. And First Samuel fifteen twenty seven through 29 And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul took hold of the edge of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, Hashem has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to a neighbor of yours, better than you. Moreover, the eminence of Israel does not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. The honor of God's prophet was ripped from his garment and as a sign or a symbol that the kingdom was to be ripped away from Saul. And for Samuel 24, 4-5, through five, And the men of David said to him, See the day which Hashem said to you, See, I am giving your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and gently cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And it came to be afterward that the heart of David struck him, because he had cut the robe of Saul. The place of the garment with the unique signifier of the honor of Saul. Something that David immediately regretted because he knew the message that it sent to Saul and to all of his servants. And because David did not feel as if it was his place to take the kingdom from Saul. And this aspect of the tzitzit served to address the grief that Israel was facing after having the promised land withheld for 40 years. You still have honor in the eyes of Hashem and before the world. You have not been rejected entirely. The honor of the census it still applies to all of Israel. And the tzitzit addresses the shame of the firstborn for having been replaced by the Levites. You were holy as well and you were not cut off from worshiping Hashem. We only have four verses on Zitzi in the book of Numbers, and only one more in the book of Deuteronomy. And yet these simple fringes contain so much that we can meditate on and learn from. And each bit of this addresses things that we have just read in the text. So do you see how this works? So let's take the next section and deal with it, because it is just a bit more shrouded than what we've just read. So for this next section, we'll be addressing verses 22 through 36 as one. The instruction for a sin of mistake, and a purposeful sin, and the man caught gathering sticks and what happened to him. Now, if the people of Israel sin by mistake in not following one of the commands that has been given to Moses, 
When it's discovered that a sin has been committed, then there's a sacrifice that can be accomplished to pay for the sin. Now, this first part, verses 23 through 26, deals with the communal or national sins. This would be like the Jews not wearing the blue thread because they're not sure how to make the dye anymore. If it is brought to their attention that any shade will do, then their omission would be a communal sin by mistake. Likewise, if messianics who use whatever shade of blue comes to hand discover that there is a specific dye or shade that should be used, then this also is a communal sin by mistake. This type of communal sin is not held against the offenders. There is an atonement to be had for this type of sin. And the same thing applies to an individual. If a person discovers that they have done something that they should not or have not done, something that they should have done, then there is an atonement for the sin. And in this we find a mercy that is the complete opposite of the American legal system. In America, ignorance of the law is no excuse for breaking the law. But in the Torah, breaking the law in ignorance, well, it's allowable. A person cannot be held responsible any further than the sacrifice necessary for their atonement. Now, there is, throughout the various takes on the Bible, the idea that those who are not Jewish are not beholden to the entirety of the commands of God. Now, this is very popular in Judaism as well as in Christianity. Jews should keep the Torah, but Gentiles shouldn't really even try beyond the moral imperatives of the New Testament. In this view, the passages that state that there is one Torah for the Ger and the native-born, they make the case that this only applies in a case-by-case basis. So earlier in this chapter, when we read of one law, it only applies to bringing the extras along with the sacrifices. And when we read of this in connection to the Passover, well, that's where it should stay, and it should not stray from that. And when this is stated in Leviticus 22, it should only be understood as one civil law for both, not one religious law, and so on and on. But I believe that this passage shines a light on that idea. In verse 29, we read that there should be one Torah for those who commit a sin by mistake, both the native-born and the stranger. Well, what is under discussion in this passage beginning in verse 22? Verse 22 through 23. And when you sin by mistake and do not do all these commands which Hashem has spoken to Moshe, all that he has commanded you by the hand of Moshe from the day Hashem gave command and onward throughout your generations. This is what is being covered in this passage. All that Hashem has commanded by the hand of Moses. And if anyone sins by mistake against what? Against the Noahide laws? Against the moral laws of the New Testament? Against the leading of the Spirit? No. It's against all that Hashem has commanded you by the hand of Moses. The entirety of the Torah. Whether Ger stranger, or native-born. And this is not the only time that we read this command in this chapter. Earlier in verse 15 through 16, we read the same thing. One Torah for all. As you are, so is the ger before Hashem. One Torah and one judgment for both. Now these sections, they're not here for no reason. They too address several things from the previous stories. First, they recognize Caleb and his role in Israel. Now, it may be one of the reasons that the people did not listen to Caleb when he made his plea for courage and obedience is that they did not count him as one of them. Who is this foreigner to tell us about our God? Who is he to lecture us? He's not even one of us. He's a Kenizzite. Perhaps he seeks for all of us to fail as well. He's trying to trick us into attacking so that his people can kill us all. Now, I don't know for sure that this is how it went down, but it makes sense. And it would explain why this idea of one law, one body, one nation before Hashem, regardless of native-born or friendly foreigner status, is stated here. All are treated the same before Hashem. As we read in Galatians 3, there is no Jew or Gentile before Hashem. And as we read elsewhere, there is no partiality in Hashem. All that worship him are treated the same. One Torah, one judgment, one nation, one sacrifice. Alongside this, we see the role of the priest highlighted. 
It is their role to intercede for the people when sin has been committed. Just as Moses did in chapter 14 when Hashem pronounced judgment on the nation, so too the priests are to intercede on behalf of the people. For the rest, for high-handed and purposeful sins, there is no restitution. There is no sacrifice or atonement that can make atonement for this from the animal realm. Verse 20 states it clearly. For the one who does something defiantly, they have demonstrated that they revile Hashem, and they should be cut off from the midst of Israel. And it's this that David recognizes in Psalm 51 when he commits adultery with Bathsheba and then has her husband killed. Psalm 51, 14 through 17 says, Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, God of my salvation. Let my tongue sing aloud of your righteousness. O Hashem, open my lips that my mouth declare your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it. You do not delight in ascending offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed. O God, these you do not despise. And then we read the story of the man who was caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And as we read this, the usual tendency is to try to pinpoint the motivations of this man. Was he intending to build a fire? Was it for warmth? Uh, Perhaps it was for smelting, or, or maybe for cooking. Was he intending to do some carving, or maybe some woodworking? Was he going to build something? And then the reason for determining this is because our minds rebel at the idea that Hashem would have had a man killed if his reason was to gather wood for a fire simply to stay warm. And so he must have had some other purpose to his gathering, something work-related. But the fact of the matter is that we aren't told his motivation for gathering sticks. We are only told his offense. It was a slight one to be sure, but it was against what was commanded. What was commanded, all the way back in Exodus 16, is that everyone refrains from working in any way. And so this man simply gathering the sticks was acting in a high-handed, purposeful sin. A slight one to be sure, but rebellious nonetheless. And in this we find the curse of the law. It's very easy to turn to the curses that are listed in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and to point to those as the curse of the law that Paul speaks of in Galatians and elsewhere. But those places address communal curses. None of those are individual, and Paul is speaking to individuals in Galatians. It's not the grand communal curses that he speaks of. It's this right here. Those who find their justification before God through keeping the commands of the Torah, they must never once commit a purposeful sin, or they will fall under this curse. Death. The same judgment for the very first high-handed sin in Genesis 3. And all they did was eat the wrong thing. Galatians 5.4 You who are declared right by the Torah... You have severed yourself from the Messiah, and you have fallen from grace. If you are declared right by what you do, you are severed from the grace of Messiah. You are only ever justified by faith and allegiance to Yeshua. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You do not keep the Torah to be justified or to gain your salvation. That is the way of death. You keep the law, you keep the Torah, because you're part of Israel. And so the laws that govern Israel, they're your laws too. And this passage here is the reason that I brought out the connections to the book of Exodus last week. Each one of the things that we read of occurring in these stories, they are things that everyone had experienced before. No one had the excuse of ignorance in any of the events of these stories. Every sin committed here, all of the slander, was not simply a lack of faith. It was defiance from a hard heart. And Hashem does not take kindly to defiance. Defiance is a rejection of Him and His ways, and defiance leads to judgment. And that brings us to the first part of this chapter, the parts that are oh so very hard to connect with what came before. And this first part of the chapter, it can be broken down into two other sections. 
There's verse 17 through 20. When you come into the land you are, and you bake some bread, give some of the bread to Hashem. It's a, it's a sort of first fruits offering. It's from this that command that the tradition of tossing a lump of dough into the fire came from. And we read of this in Romans 11:16. Now, if the first fruit is set apart, then the lump is also. And if the root is set apart, so are the branches. And what is it that this section addresses? When you come into the land. While in the wilderness, this does not need apply. You will bake bread, and when you do, give some to me. Earlier in chapter 11, Israel had slandered the manna, this bread from heaven. They spoke against it, even though they did not have to work to receive it. For 40 years, God gave Israel bread from his own table. And so when Israel enters the land, Hashem desires for Israel to give a portion of their bread back to him. This is a nod to the gift of the manna and the recognition that the manna is not going to last forever. The discontent at the lack of variety while in the wilderness will go away. The current state of affairs is only temporary. And so we get to the first part of the chapter. Once again, we see the same thing happening here. When you get into the land, you will have grain and wine and oil to accompany your sacrifices. You will have the bounty of the land. The lack of variety that you complained of before, well, that will be a thing of the past. This, too, is something that will pass away. Give it time. And what is it that Hashem is doing with these commands? In a way, He's demonstrating that He is throwing His lot in with Israel. It's Him saying, I know that I have limited you in what you can eat, and so I am limiting myself in what you can sacrifice to me. For now... All that I expect in a sacrifice is the animals, or the grain that was prescribed earlier in Leviticus. The rest of these things that are also part of the sacrificial system that you will implement later, well, you can give them to me when you inherit the land that I have promised to you. In a way, Hashem is connecting His own prophet with their prophet. You think that you're doing without here in the wilderness? Well, I'm doing without as well. You're not unique. So your complaints to me about lack of variety, well, they're not landing. Just remember, we're in this together. When you inherit the bounty of the promised land, then I stand to gain as well. Hashem does without for the sake of training his children to be obedient. He gives up on what is due him because bringing them up is more important. And so as we see, this chapter is not out of place at all. The events of the past are being addressed. You don't like the limited diet you're on? Well, what's due to me is limited too, so get over yourselves and buckle down to what's important. You're tired of this bread? Well, it is bread from my table. And when you get to where I'm taking you, then I expect bread from your table. You don't like the foreigner who resides with you? You see them as some sort of second-class citizen? Well, look to Caleb. He gets to inherit the land when none of you do, because I don't care where you came from or who your daddy is. Everyone who worships me is equal in my sight, and I expect the same from everyone. There are no second-class citizens or resident aliens when it comes to the Torah and matters of justice, and any and all sins of defiance will result in your removal from the community no matter how small a thing may seem. When you act defiantly towards me, you are revealing what you truly think of me. You will be judged harshly for such defiance. But even though the promise has been delayed, even though you have failed me over and over, even though you are feeling shamed even now, you are people of honor because you are mine. You are people of holiness because you are mine. You are priests to the nations because you are mine. And as long as you remember what I've told you and keep your eyes on what I have promised and not on your circumstances, then you will reach your destination. And that's where we are today. We've been given promises by God for this age. Our promised land is not dirt somewhere in the Middle East. Our promised land is the millennial kingdom ruled by Hashem's anointed. Our promised land is eternal life with Him. 
This is where we are being brought as a people and as a world. We must continue, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of how lean things get, regardless of how frightening things may seem. We must not lose sight of the promise. We must remember the honor that he has bestowed on us. We must remember our role as priests and kings. And most of all, we must remember to do what he says. For his Torah is life. Not life in this wilderness of the flesh, but life eternal at his side. This was demonstrated by his son concretely. The promise, the plan, the gift, the anointed. These are the things of life. So let's latch to them and hold tight in this time of testing. And in doing so, you will be on the path of seeking life. So Deresh Chai, Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Deresh Chai. If this content has blessed you and you would like more, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing with others. To find out more about what we do and to support this ministry, head over to SeekLifeSC.com. That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Shalom.